You may be seated. On the court is now in session. This morning. The chamber will continue to hear the testimony of the witness o n g t o n g h u n g and if time permits, we will hear the testimony of the witness Sung s i k u n As the chamber already informed the parties and the public. The chamber will hear the two witnesses in alternate sessions. As for the witness o n g t o n g h u n g who shall be heard this morning, will be questioned by the party, and as he cannot change his air ticket, the chamber decides to hear this morning. And we will hear him before another witness, Ms. s a k o l b u t i Could you report the attendance of the parties and individuals to the proceeding? s a k o l b u t i Mr. President, all parties to the proceeding are present except the accused, i y u n g s a r i who is present in the holding cell downstairs, as he requests to wear his. Present through his counsel, and the request is for the whole day proceeding. The letter of waiver has been submitted to the g r a f i e r As for the witnesses, Ong t o n g h u n g and Sung s i k u n are both present in the waiting room. Thank you. President, thank you. The chamber will now decide the request made by the accused Ying Sari. The chamber has received the request by Ying Sari dated 14th August 2012 through his counsel to have his direct presence in the proceeding, and instead to follow it through a remote means for the whole day. I am s a v e n the treating doctor at the ECCC detention facility. Has examined the accused this morning and observes that Ying Sari is fatigued, visits the toilet frequently, and has backache. And he recommends that the accused shall be allowed to follow the proceeding. Through a remote means in a holding cell downstairs, and as Mr. i n g s a r i requests to have his direct presence in the courtroom due to his health, and as observed by the treating doctor, and that he requests to follow the proceeding through a remote means, and that he can also communicate with his defense team directly. The chamber does agree to the request by the accused in Sari to have his direct present in this proceeding, and allows him to follow it through an audio-visual means from the holding cell downstairs for the whole day proceeding. A V Booth, you instructed to link the proceeding to the holding cell downstairs so that in Sari can follow it for the whole day. Court officer, can you invite Ong t o n g h u n g the witness, into the courtroom?
President. Good morning, Mr. Ong Tong Hương. The Chamber will this morning continue to hear your testimony. You will be questioned by the defense. There are two defense teams who are to question you. That is the defense team for Yen Sari and for Kiu Song Hoon. Before I hand the floor to the defense, I'd like to remind the witness that you saw be careful and try to listen to the question and limit your response to what you are asked and non, don't make any unnecessary comment otherwise it's going to have uh, some mental effect on you the floor is now given to Ian Sari's defense to continue putting questions to this witness. You may proceed. Good morning, Mr. President. Good morning, Your Honors. Good morning to everyone in and around the courtroom. And good morning to you, sir. Let's pick up where we left off. We were talking about your affiliation back in, in Paris when you were a student and you got involved with uh, funk. Now, according to your uh, testimony, and I'm referring to zero zero, come here, zero zero eight three two five seven four to seven five, and then I just have the numbers. In English, it would be page 77, and in French, it's 86 to 87. This is from your testimony on August the 7th. You indicate that the front movement was under the direction of Ying Sari, and that it was meant to reconcile and unite Khmer people who had different political uh, trends to join as one unified association. Do you recall saying this, sir? But yes, I recall that. And now, and, and during your testimony, you also repeatedly told us about the five points that had been articulated, and the impression that you left, at least with some of us, was that you were motivated to join a funk because of Sihanouk, as opposed to uh, Inksuri or others. Am I correct in drawing that conclusion based on your testimony? I'm referring to overall, sir. So the answer won't be found in that page. General, I acknowledge that uh, the intention, yes. All right. Now, if we could go back to uh, what David Chandler wrote about you in the tragedy of Cambodian history, I'm referring to D108 slash 50 slash 1.75, and unfortunately, we don't have it translated. Uh, but I'm referring to in English, the air number will be air numbers will be zero zero one nine three three seven three, and it will go into uh, seven four. There's a section with your name on it. 
can I assume that at some point uh, you met with Mr. Chandler and as a result of you meeting with him, he wrote certain things about you in his book. Is that a fair assumption? Sir, the question, the question is not not it's not on the page yet. I mean, I haven't referred to the to the document. I'm asking you a simple question. Did you or did you not meet with David Chandler when he was writing his book, Tragedy, the Tragedy of Cambodian History, where you are featured in particularly three or four pages? In general, I met Chandler as uh, other people. I must first clarify that I am the author and I acknowledge and stand by my book or any statement I made. And if you put a question to me as how I saw judge other books written by other authors about me, I cannot make that judgment. Uh, thank you. Uh, now, if you could answer my question. Did you or did you not meet with Professor Chandler where he, where he was asking questions for writing a textbook, a book, a history book, where you are featured in. And there's a title called Ong Tong Hung. That would be you. So did you meet with him? It's a yes or no. Yes, I met uh, with Chandler. Now, Having met with Chandler and having been interviewed by Chandler and being featured in Chandler's book, did you by any chance purchase the book or look at the book to see what exactly Chandler wrote about you? And to witness, please wait. The prosecution, you may proceed. Merci, Monsieur. Thank you, Mr. President, Your Honours, uh, colleagues. Mr. President, this question has already been put to the witness, as was the previous question. So I do not think we should go that far to resume the examination of the witness because these questions have already been put to him. Uh, Mr. President, I'm about to confront him with what is in Mr. Chandler's book. He indicated that he met with Chandler and that he spoke with Chandler. I now ask him whether he read what Chandler wrote based on the interview before I confront him with what is written. I think it's a fair question to put to the witness before I confront him with a document. President, the objection and its ground by the prosecution is valid as the question is repetitive. Witness, you do not need to respond to the last question put to you by Israel's defense. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. 
Uh, if we could turn to Khmer 00832568, English page 70, French page 78 to 79. This would be from the testimony on August 7th. Uh, you said that you look, look, look. President, Council, please repeat your question and try to slow down when it comes to the EIN number so that the interpreter can be accurate on the record. Just then the interpreter could not get the EIN number. I'm referring to the transcript of August 7, Khmer 0083. 2568. English, page 70. French, page 78 to 79. Here you say, I learned of that during my research for my book. Let me put it to you this way. Did you do any research for your book? And if so, in doing your research, did you consult what Chandler had written in general? I did not read Chandler's book. All right. <clears throat> now, in his book, nonetheless, Chandler featuring you says, and I'm referring to the page that should be on the screen there in English, it's 00193373. It says here, Ong Tong Hong, born in 1945, had earned a government scholarship for tertiary study in France when he was 20. He lived in Paris for the next 11 years and was drawn into left-wing political circles after the student uprising in May 1968 and the coup d'etat in Cambodia two years later. Hung was an enthusiastic supporter of the NUFK, though motivated less by his fondness for the Sihanouk than by his anger at the United States and his distaste for Le Nol's regime. The Front's political program seemed to Hung to be a refreshing departure from Cambodia's past. Now, a little earlier, you told us you were drawn more towards Sihanouk. Here, it appears that you were not fond of him, but you were, you were fond of the program, which you identified to be Ink Ceres, under Ink Ceres direction. Do I have it right? Let me clarify that I cannot respond or give you comment on what other people wrote. I will respond regarding the content of the books or the statements that I personally made and acknowledge it with my signature. And I am present here. I will respond to you based on the experience that I have learned. All right. Now, so we don't have to refer back to this document again. On the same page, this actually that would be the following page, which is 00193374. David Chandler writes, based on his interview of you, expecting to use his tertiary training and his intellectual skills he was pitchforked into the world of revolutionary praxis. Were those your expectations, sir, as you represented to David Chandler?
nhưng ông sẽ Let me once again repeat my previous response. I cannot make any comment based on what has been written by other people about me. All right. He then goes on to say, for the rest of 1976, Huang worked in Phnom Penh in a factory making electric pumps in an agricultural cooperative at Takmao on the outskirts of the city. Is that correct, sir? I once again would like to make any comment based on what has been written by other people about me. If you want to know, please read my book or any article by that I wrote and that I acknowledge or signed. Uh, and finally, so we can leave this document, Professor Chandler, who testified here as an expert for the court, writes in his book that you've noted to him, working conditions were harsh but food was adequate. Did you tell this to Professor Chandler when he interviewed you for his book? I repeat my same response. If you really want to know, please, it's better for you to read my book. I don't really know the intention that you are trying to get, that you try to ask me questions based on the work of other people. Now, when you were testifying, you were asked at one point whether Mr. Inksri evoked patriotism and nationalism to convince you and others to return to Cambodia, and that would be from the transcript of August 8, on Khmer page 53, English page 66, and French page 72. Do you recall being asked that question? And you indicated he mainly talked about nationalism, patriotism, self-mastery, self-dependence, and he repeatedly emphasized on the point that Cambodia was not an umbrella company to Vietnam. Do you recall saying that? Thank you, Counsel, for asking me the question. I clearly recall that was my statement in general and personally, it was Ian Sari who introduced our 1,700 people uh, coming from overseas. Right. Well, let me make sure I get it right, though. Prior to Mr. Inksri coming, as early as 1968, according to your interview with Chandler, you became politically involved with the left movement. And then you told us last week, for sure, 1970, with the uh, Lono government committing the coup d'etat. Ink Sheree had nothing to do with that, did he? I do not get your question. Can you refresh it? All right. According to David Chandler, based on his interview with you, you began getting involved in left-wing politics as early as 1968 when there, were, there was an uprising in Paris. You may recall that event. It was rather famous. Do you recall it? And isn't that the cause of you getting involved in left-wing politics? In 
general and let me repeat. I will now respond to the questions regarding the work that other has written about me. Of course, all those authors have the right to write uh, something about me, but I myself will only confirm the statements of book that I personally wrote. Now, you were asked on a, qu a question back in uh, August 7th about going back, repatriating back to Cambodia. And on Khmer page 00832578, English page 82, and French page 91, you say, in hindsight, the feeling of many Camb Cambodians, including myself, was that we did not want to stay in foreign country. We want to return and to die back in our native country. And then you went on to say, I never for once wanted to stay or live till my death in a foreign country. Now let me, let's talk about that a little bit. Uh, you left on a scholarship to go to France. Is that right? I did make comments regarding the feeling of the uh, Cambodian students at the time as we really loved our country and uh, that we were living overseas at the time. Let me repeat my question because we're going to go step by step. You voluntarily went to Paris on a scholarship to study. Is that right? I decline to respond to your question as your question is irrelevant to my testimony before this court. What prevented you, sir, since you weren't getting a university degree by your own admission last week, what prevented you from returning back to Cambodia in 68, 69, 70, 71, 72, 73, 74, 75. What prevented you from returning back to Cambodia? You are attempting to dig up this information, but personally, I don't think it is of any relevance to my presence here before this court. Sir, I'm basing my question on the answer that you provided and based on what you want this trial chamber to believe, that it was somehow patriotism and nationalism that convinced you to return, when in fact, by your own admission here, you indicate that you wanted to go back to Cambodia, that you did not want to die abroad. And I'm pointing out that for 11 years, nothing prevented you from returning since you weren't getting an education, as you were supposed to be getting. So can you please answer the question? At that time, I did not intend to return to the country due to some personal reasons. And later on, when I believed in the advice in or instructions by Insari, I returned to Cambodia amongst many other Cambodian students. 
as the situation in Cambodia before was not favorable for me to return. And only later on, uh, when the situation was favorable, I returned. Now, you've, you've told us that you saw Mr. Ng Sri two or three times when uh, he was in Paris. But I'm not quite clear whether you actually ever met him personally and talked to him, tete a tete. Can you please tell us? No, I never met him in person, but I met with other Cambodian uh, uh, who went to attend the meeting with him. And what about uh, pr Prince uh, Sihanouk? When he w was abroad, and we know that at least on one occasion you went to see him in, in Bucharest, uh, did you have uh, an opportunity to have a discussion with the prince, or were you just in the audience listening to what he was saying? But uh, I had a courtesy call on him when uh, he invited other. Uh, Cambodian uh, expatriates uh, to meet him when he was in France. And can you please tell us about that? Uh, what exactly was uh, Prince Sihanouk uh, talking about when you went for that courtesy call? And in what capacity was he there? At that time, it was um, the legitimate uh, head of state of Cambodia, and he also reported to the Cambodian expatriates over there about the, uh, his official visit uh, in France as well as in different parts of Europe. He met with the state, uh, head of states uh, of uh, other countries in Europe, namely uh, Tito and a number of other heads of states. So this would have been before the coup d'etat, before 1970, when you say he was the legitimate head of state. Are we to interpret that you met him before 1970? Dave, you know. No, I said uh, that I met him uh, after 1970. At that time, he was a legitimate head of state, and I based my assertion based on the recognition by the United, United Nations at that time that he, he was the head of state of Cambodia then. Well, was he part of the funk Runk movement at the time, part of the front? Council, I have already answered this question. I would like to uh, emphasize uh, that it was him uh, who was the leader of the uh, funk, and he was also the uh, heads of states of the Royal Government of National Union of Cambodia. All right. Now that we've clarified that, was he also at that point in time telling Cambodians abroad to assist in toppling the regime that had toppled him? But Well, that was the uh, principle which uh, he uh, had introduced to others. He, I did not uh, know exactly when he m mentioned or made uh, that appear, but he uh, 
said uh, that he wanted to contribute in order to tell Cambodian both inside uh, Cambodia and overseas in order to resist against the regime that had toppled him. Right. And uh, I take it, well, let me, let me rephrase it. Was he evoking patriotism and nationalism for the students, the Cambodian students such as yourself, to assist in the struggle against the Lenol regime and for what it stood? To the best of my understanding, yes, he did. And it was not difficult to respond to that question because according to the uh, available public uh, literature, he also, they also mentioned about uh, that appeal. And other leaders, including Mr. Ying Sari, also made such similar appeal. Uh, thank you. Now, did you ever have an opportunity where uh, you were in the presence of a meeting between uh, Mr. Ng Shari and Prince uh, Sihanouk. Some, some, some. Consul, would you mind repeating your question? Yes. Uh, well, did you ever participate in any meetings where King, uh, Prince Sihanouk was meeting with Ms. Ng Sri and they were discussing matters? But him died. Yes, I did. I went to your room. But when I... Ten, when I was attending the meeting uh, with uh, the prince, at that time the prince uh, was the uh, person who talked uh, a lot. And when he met with Ying Sari, I did not notice whether or not Ying Sari did make any observation then. All right. And I guess my question was, uh, let, me, let me ask a follow-up question. Did you ever have the opportunity to be present when Mr. Ying Sari and Prince uh, Sihanouk were having a discussion among themselves. But can you that uh, no, no, I, I didn't. I never, pre I was never present. Now, in your testimony on August uh, 9, 2012. Khmer 0083 English it would be page 14, French it would be page 15. Uh, you were asked a question and uh, based on something that you have said in the past that Ing Shari had substantial influence. If Samdak Sihanouk wanted to do anything but uh, but it was opposed by Ing Sri that would not be done. That was in document E3 slash 97. And you then go on to say, part of your answer, because you were asked, how did you know? Because me, Mr. Ing Sri always made it known to others that he was the representative of the party, uh, of the people and other dignitaries were merely, were merely the silly people who follow others blindly. Uh, let me ask you concretely, because uh, you told us now that you never had a tete-a-tete -tete with Mr. Ng Sari. Is it your testimony today that Mr. Ng Sari said these sort of things to, to, in your presence?
nhóm đi dây sập lòng let me uh, clarify this again uh, if council has uh, followed uh, the uh, student cambodian students overseas and their movement at that time when um, Mr. Ian Sari was in France, or so he had his own networks. In his uh, circle, there were uh, friends who were former members of the Leninist Marxist uh, circle in France. And those members were the core forces for handling uh, on the relationship between uh, Cambodian uh, living overseas. And in my personal observation, that was the uh, recognition of uh, other observers and commentators who uh, had studied about the Cambodian students uh, overseas and their movement. Uh, so now if you could answer my question. Do you recall what my question was? Sir, I asked you a concrete question, and that is when you were present, because you've indicated you saw you were present at a meeting where Prince uh, Sihanouk and Inksari were present and were speaking. Did you ever hear Mr. Inksari make the comments that you are attributing to him in your testimony? It's a yes or it's a no. The President, uh, witness, please hold on. Prosecutor, you may proceed. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the initial question was centered uh, on the fact of knowing whether Ying Sari had uh, pronounced such statements but did not say that this necessarily happened in the presence of Prince Sianuk. However, the second question reduces uh, these statements uh, to the moment when allegedly the witness attended a meeting where Yang Sari and Prince Sianuk were present. So it seems that this considerably reduces the scope of the question and asking the witness to answer by yes or by no seems to be a little bit limited, whereas he might have heard these statements uh, during a meeting with Yitzhari without uh, Prince Sianuk being present. So I would like the question to be put again in a broader way. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, uh, the consul obviously might have lost it in translation or is just mischaracterizing the thrust of my question. Uh, I went step by step. I wanted to lock the witness in whether he had participated in, in any meetings. He makes a rather bold statement. I'm asking him whether he was present at any time in a meeting, whether, whether it's just in Shari, or in Shari and the and, and the prince. You can answer the question. Response. I made it clear already that I had never attended a meeting with uh, the presence of Prince uh, Sienu and uh, Ying Sari uh, when they were together.
but I never attended in the meeting when the two of them uh, discussed any matters together. But uh, let me make it uh, clear on that point. When there was a meeting between uh, Prince Senu and uh, Mr. Ying Sari, during which only Senu was the sole or solo presenter, and I never heard uh, any, uh, any words uh, from Mr. Ying Sari during such meeting. All right, thank you. Uh, let's move on to another topic. Um, when you arrived uh, in Cambodia back in uh, 1976, I understand that the first place you went to was at uh, K-15, is that correct? Yes, that is correct. And if I understand your testimony, uh, it was at K-15 where your belongings were searched and everything was taken away, such as books. Is that right? Yes, that is correct. Now, did they just take books away, or did they also take uh, pens, pencils, uh, notepads? Generally, they uh, took away the radios and other unnecessary uh, belongings, including books. And even writing pads, uh, they, they took uh, some of them away and, and they left uh, some with, with others. And can you tell us uh, who was allowed to keep writing pads and who wasn't? Because you seem to be making some sort of a distinction that some were allowed some materials while others were not allowed any. I did not uh, pay attention to that when, but when we got to uh, that camp, they searched our luggages and they took away some belongings and I did not know the motive for uh, the confiscation of those uh, items, uh, but it was up to them as to what they decided to remove uh, from us. There was no basis or information uh, whatsoever concerning that. All right. Now, uh, at that time, did you know who was uh, K-15, who was responsible for that institution? When I first arrived in that place, I did not know who uh, was responsible uh, for that uh, office, but uh, later on, I found out that the person in charge uh, was Pum. Okay, the, he's the person in charge, but who did Pum work for? Who was his superior? But him at that I did not know, but I only knew that he was the representative of Anka. All right. Well, in writing your book, you did some research from your own admission, and in your book you state, and I'm, I don't have the Khmer number, unfortunately, uh, but the English here would be 00785761. In French, it's 00287929. It says here, the former Khmer Soviet Friendship Technical Institute had been transformed into a unit for people arriving from abroad like us. 
it bore the name K-15. As with all units reserved for intellectuals, it was under the direct supervision of the Central Committee of the Party. Do you stand by what you wrote? Matt. Yes, I stand by uh, this statement. When I first arrived in that uh, uh, place, I did not know that it was under the responsibility and supervision of the Central Committee at that time, but it was only later on when I started writing the book, I heard from others that it was under the direct supervision of the Central Committee. Uh, thank you. And what I guess I want to focus on is the sentence say, as with all units reserved for intellectuals. So, at least in English, it would appear that you're saying that where all intellectuals were kept, those premises were supervised by the Central Committee of the Party. That's what your research led you to conclude. Is that correct? Yes, that's, that's what I heard uh, from others, that Pum, I did not know his uh, official uh, rank, but he was under the uh, direction of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of Cambodia. That, but that I learned it uh, later on when I started writing this book. All right. And then you qualify or you give us a definition of who comes under the heading of intellectuals. We're grouped students, professionals, engineers, civil servants, and the elite of the former regime. And that's what your research led you to conclude, correct? Matt. Yes. And so, if I understand you correctly, after K-15, from there you went to Bong Terbeck. Do I have it right? Or did you go someplace else before that? After I left uh, K-15, then I went to D-2. Right. And uh, now we know from your testimony that you ended up in Bong Trebek in 1978, sometime around October or November, because uh, you say the last couple months before Phnom Penh falls to the Vietnamese. Had you been there before, and if so, can you please tell us about what time, what period, what year? In general, I went to uh, Bang Trabai uh, twice. The first one, it was when bef before I left for Dekra home. And then uh, the second time was in late 1978, as uh, the uh, council rightly pointed out. And the first time that you were there, uh, that would have been 1976, correct? That's correct. And so the statement that you have here, that as, as with all units reserved for intellectuals, it was under the direct supervision of the Central Committee of the Party, can we rightly conclude from what you write here 
is that when you were at Bong Trebek the first time, that that was being under the direct supervision of the Central Committee of the party. It was only my uh, supposition, and I heard it uh, from others uh, through my uh, personal research. It led me to uh, understand it as such. Whenever you say supposition, I have to press you a little bit because I'm not asking you to, to suppose, to assume. I'm asking you to verify based on what you wrote because I see nothing about supposition in your book here. So can you please be concrete? And I did write it. Sir, I'm not asking whether you wrote it. I'm asking you to confirm that based on your research that you conducted in writing a book, that you stand behind as true, accurate, and complete what you write here. As with all units reserved for intellectuals, it was under the direct supervision of the Central Committee. Now, this is back in 1976. Can you confirm, based on your research, that in 1976, Bong Trebek was under the direct supervision of the Central Committee of the Party based on your research. The President, uh, witness, please hold on. Prosecutor, you may proceed. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I see perfectly clearly where the defense is going because it's uh, basing itself on the book, of course, written by the witness. And however, we took care to ask the witness to distinguish what he had seen, and we didn't ask him these kinds of questions. And what bothers us, Mr. President, is that we're trying here to ask the witness to become an expert, and the witness here is not here as an expert. He's here as a witness, so that is my objection to this kind of question. I may briefly respond. When the prosecution is up here, they refer to the book. Not a problem. Today, I press the gentleman. He tells me that I should ask him questions based on his own writing. I'm now asking him questions on his own writing, and there are no qualifications as to what he stated. He indicated that he did some research, and I'm asking him to confirm. This is an important issue. Now, he can say that what he wrote was false. I'll accept that. He can say that what he wrote, he's not, he will not stand behind it 100 percent because he's uncertain, because he might have learned something thereafter. He can say that he was just guessing when he wrote it, or he can say that he stands behind it. There's a universe of choices, but his credibility is at issue here, and his testimony is at issue here. And when he goes to Bong Trebek, and who controls or supervises Bong Trebek at which point in time is vitally important because we've heard testimony about the conditions. And that's why I'm pressing the gentleman for this question. The President of Witness, you do not need to respond to the last question. It is a repetitive question which has already been answered by the witness. Secondly, counsel, you seem not to remember the response, and later on, 
you put a question which try to draw a conclusion from the witness. Please uh, prepare your question appropriately. And the chamber observes that some of your questions cannot be sooner be used, especially the form of the yes or no questions. Uh, very well, Mr. President. I don't want to debate the point, but can I have the trial chamber's uh, version of what the statement was? What did he say about this? Does he stand behind this? Because you've indicated that the question was asked and answered. I don't know what the answer is. President, please make sure your question does not draw a conclusion from the witness. The witness responded that he wrote it that way through his research and his experience of living there. And you said that the re his response was a kind of a con a conclusion, but in fact, your second question to him was to draw his personal conclusion. From your observation, sir, can you please describe to us whether the conditions were the same the first time you, that you were there versus the second time that you were there? can tell you, counsel, that in 1976, the living condition in Bang Trabai was difficult. However, in 1978, that is after we returned, the situation was not uh, as strict as previously. Where was there more food? in 78 than there was in 76. In 1978, there was sufficient food. It was not abandoned, but for us who did not have enough to eat before, was sufficient, and uh, some of us uh, became uh, more healthy physically. Now, in your in your book, uh, and you were questioned by Judge Laverne on this, not extensively, but uh, you did indicate that there was a chip that you had met the second time you went to Bong Trabac. Is that correct? As I recall, it was the person who received us from the boat. Right. And as I understand it, uh, you associated him with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and at one point, I believe you might have ind even indicated that he was under So Hong. Is that correct? I never went to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. However, in my book, I wrote that he went to receive us when we returned from Dekro home, and he uh, took us to stay for one night near uh, Wat Phnom, and uh, next morning, he took us to Bang Tra Bay. Maybe something is getting lost in translation. I, I never said that you went to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Was it your understanding that this individual by the name of Chip was under the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Mm, 
Yes, yeah, she must uh, have come from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, as he said that he was instructed by Insari to come to fetch us. Well, according to your testimony, and I'm referring to transcript on August 9th, Khmer 0083358, English is page 50, and then French is page 54. You state that uh, when you were asked about it, about this individual, I met him, and when I saw his face, I find his face familiar when his picture was printed in the newspaper. I thought that was him. He was the close aide of So Hong. So let me put it to you this way. Was it your understanding back then that he was So Hong's close aide based on your interactions or based on what he might have said? When I saw the photo, although I was not 100% sure it was his photo, and if so, he was the close aide of So Hong. All right. Now let me press you a little bit on, the, on seeing the photo. When was it that you saw his photo? Because you say here uh, that you saw... You saw it in the press, I believe. So can you please tell us in which context did you see the gentleman's face, his photograph? I saw his photo on the internet. All right, well, can you be a little more specific? Were you following the proceedings? And as a result of following the proceedings, you saw his photograph? Did you read an article concerning his testimony, what he testified here under oath? In what context did you see the photograph? on the internet. I am uh, not sure. My wife uh, saw the photo, so she told me. So I looked at the photo and uh, it looks familiar. As I said, I am not 100% sure whether it was his photo, and I did not any. I did not read any other other text besides seeing that photo. All right. Well, we've had a gentleman here testify. His name is Chim. Uh, there's no chip, as you've indicated in your book, C H E A P. Uh, that would have been working for Mr. So Hong. Is it possible that you have uh, the wrong name, that it should be Chiem as opposed to Chip? Chiem. What I said was not based on my 100% certainty, and I repeat that once again. Regarding the name, sometimes people change their names to mask their identity. So I cannot say for sure whether I am 100% certain regarding the names I use or quote. 
All right, so it's, it's your understanding that he might have been masking his name. He might have been going under cheap, which is why you wrote him on several occasions in your book as cheap, the one that was also riding a Honda, a Honda Moto. President, today, Prosecutor, you may proceed. Thank you, Mr. President. The, the defense counsel is asking the witness to speculate again by asking this question, which is repetitive. It was already asked by the judge, and he says, perhaps, thereby inviting the witness to confirm his hypothesis. This is not a proper manner of putting questions to the witness. Thank you. Your Honor, uh, there is a point to this uh, exercise. He's indicated, he's written a book where on numerous occasions uh, he represents that this person by the name of Chip now, you can look high and you can look low on the case file. You won't find this name as somebody working under So Hong in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. We heard So Hong testify. We heard Chiam testify, who also went by P. Pum. Now, there is a reason why I'm asking this question, and I want to make sure that this is not a typographical error. This is what he put down. And if he, if he wants to claim now that this might be some other revolutionary name, that's fine. But there's no evidence thus far that Chiam went by Chip or that a Chip actually existed. Hence, why I'm pressing the gentleman for a clear answer. President, the question is repetitive, so witness, you do not need to respond. Now, you were posed a series of questions by Judge Laverne where you were asked to verify certain quotes that can be found in your, in your book and your testimony. And I guess my question is, or in your statement, I should say, but my question is this. Uh, if you were, if you did indeed have the notes as you claim you had, you had no, a notepad where you were keeping notes when you wrote this particular chapter, how on earth did you get such a significant name grossly wrong? Normally, for authors, and personally, sometimes I use a pseudonym for other people, or sometimes I don't use the real names. However, when it comes to the name of Chip, I think the name is Chip, or it could be Chim. I am not 100% sure. But uh, what I heard was cheap, but I could uh, mis mishear it because I was told there was a person by the name of Chip who rode a motorbike and who was waiting to receive us. So I cannot 100% confirm the certainty regarding the name. Uh, let me make sure I understand your answer correctly. Uh, 
Are you suggesting that you only met this gentleman once, which, is, which may account for why you have the name wrong? I met him uh, two times, one during the day, that is after we arrived from uh, Dacre home, and in the late afternoon, he brought us to Bang Trok Bay. That was the second time. Subsequently, he also returned to Bang Trok Bay, but I never met him. And can you please tell us what name did you put down in your notebook where you had all these other quotes? Or did you have a notebook? I put the word or the name Chip. Now, sticking with this notebook a little bit, can you please tell us where it is and whether you have shown this notebook to anyone such as Mr. Hedder, with whom you met back in 1980, um, 79 or 80, at the border, Professor Chandler, Henry Lacard, the investigators of the Office of the Core Investigative Judges. cannot recall it, but I used to show it to some researchers, but I am uncertain as to who they were. And, well, can you name one researcher? Because here you were interviewed February to March 1980 by Mr. Hedder, and we're going to get into that interview shortly. That would have been right after you left Phnom Penh on November 1, I believe, 1979, and you went to the border. Did you have it then, and did you share it with Hedder, who was there obviously collecting information from which he has written some rather extensive notes? I cannot recall whether I show it to him. If I show it to him, it uh, could be incidental because there was no point of me showing my personal uh, notebook to him. And I did not think of the importance of uh, showing my notebook to him. To me, it's important, but I, I do not see the significance uh, for others. All right. Well, he was there collecting information about your experiences at Bong Trebek and other places, and it was asking you some rather pointed questions. He also, let me remind you, reads, writes, and speaks Khmer. So, did you have this notebook with you at the time? You seem to remember quotes that happened some 30 years ago. Surely you would remember whether you physically had the notebook on you. I 
I can recall it. However, I recall that I indeed met with Steve Heder in Thailand. And uh, that meeting, uh, did he approach you or did you approach him? He was there as a graduate student from Cornell University doing research. Uh, so do you recall how was it that you connected with Heather at the time? I did not have the money to buy an air ticket or to meet him at Cornell University. At that time, I was in the refugee camp, and he came to meet me. All right. Well, some th I, I can only apologize because the translation must be terribly wrong because I never said anything about you going to Cornell. Let me rephrase my question or re-ask re it. How was it that you met him? Did you approach him or did he approach you? Which of the two, if you recall? He could travel anywhere he flew to meet me. How could I go to see him? Sir, again, let me press you. You're there over the border in Thailand. i like to know, how was it that you met him? Did you know of him being there conducting research and you approached him? Or was he going around looking for refugees to interview? Which of the two? It's a simple question. It's a simple question, and my simple answer is he came to meet me. All right, and how was it that he found you? How did he know that you existed where he found you, if you recall? I cannot recall it. Do you recall how many days you met with him to be interviewed? I cannot recall that event. It took place a long time ago. But I can say for certain that I met him. All right. Now, uh, let me fast forward a little bit before we get to your interview and go back to what you've written in your book, uh, where you say on page 15 that this book would not exist if Henry Lacard had not found it at Stephen Hedder's, Hedder's place. Is that what happened? You had a draft, and it was at Stephen Hedder's place, and Locard found it. That's what I wrote, and that's true, and it is a kind of a courtesy. But I do not uh, know what you want, what else you want, the counsel. One day, I still had uh, said that uh, I was uh, drafting a book, and that I will write it in French. And he said he would like to obtain a copy.
So I gave him a copy and Henry Lockhart, while he visited uh, Steve Heder in London, he came across uh, that uh, draft and encouraged me to publish it. Okay, thank you. So, if I understand you correctly, you send a manuscript to Mr. Heder in London. As I said, after I concluded the manuscript, I sent copies of them to a number of people, not only to Steve Hedder, but to others as well. And, and did Steve Hedder get back to you on, with any comments concerning your book? cannot recall it, but it, it seems none. And since uh, showing him the manuscript and publishing the book, has Stephen Hedder ever asked you to share your notes so he could have a first-hand look at notes that purportedly were taken contemporaneously to the events that you describe? No, he did not. He never asked uh, from me. Now, if we get to the... It's, I'm about to go into the interview itself, Mr. President, and I see the time. It may take a little bit longer uh, than five minutes or ten minutes. Uh, it might be an appropriate time to take a break, or we could, I could continue. I'm not sure in your hands. President, how much time do you participate, uh, anticipate in uh, finish this uh, portion? Well, this portion could take a little bit longer. I, I think I'm going to need the whole morning, and I'm hoping that by, by noon I will complete my entire examination of the gentleman. If we were to take a break now, it would give me the opportunity to uh, condense and perhaps shorten my examination, which probably is very much appreciated by everyone. Thank you. As during the Last day of your questioning, you said that you might only take uh, one hour to conclude your questioning time. And if you are to take about uh, 10 more minutes, then the floor can be passed on to another defense. But it means that, that your anticipated one hour extra is not accurate. I learned it up here. The time is not appropriate for a short recess. We will take a 20 minute break and I return at 10 to 11 to continue hearing the testimony of the witness. Court officer, could you assist the witness during the break and have him return to the courtroom at 10 to 11? Some Jane Croucher.